Okay, hi, we're gonna talk about what causes hypertension. Hypertension means high blood pressure. A typical normal blood pressure would be something like 110 over 70. That's a really good blood pressure. The number on top is called the systolic. Systolic means heart contraction, okay? The number on the bottom is always lower, and that is diastolic. That's during cardiac relaxation, when the heart's relaxing. Okay, when the heart pumps blood, it pumps it into the ascending thoracic aorta. When that happens, the ascending thoracic aorta is stretched outward. The ascending thoracic aorta has a lot of elastic fibers. More than any other blood vessel in your body, it's got tons of elastic fibers. And the ascending thoracic aorta has been called the second heart. It takes that energy, kinetic energy of cardiac contraction, and it expands outward. Then a moment later when the heart relaxes, the elastic recoil of those elastic fibers in your ascending thoracic aorta, they push inward. That's called a wind kessel. Wind kessel is like that thing for blowing air on a fire to sort of get the, the embers kindling and make them burn. So this is called the wind kessel effect. It's a very good thing. It helps to maintain a good diastolic pressure that is close in number to the systolic pressure. The difference between if you subtracted 110 from 70, that would be subtracting the big number from the smaller number from the bigger number, that would be called your pulse pressure. You want your pulse pressure to be on the small side. So this would be a pulse pressure of 40, 110 minus 70. The bigger that pulse pressure, it usually means systolic's going up. When people get older, they lose some of these elastic fibers. You can't replace the elastic fibers in your ascending thoracic aorta after about 28 years of age. And if a person keeps on doing things that make them hypertensive, eating a lot of uh, meat, a lot of saturated fat, a lot of sodium, a lot of uric acid from drinking lots of sweetened drinks like fructose, they will trash the elastic fibers in their ascending thoracic aorta and the, elastic, the ascending thoracic aorta will be all calcified. Every day I see calcified thoracic aortas. That's bad. Because when you lose the elastic recoil, you'll have a harder time maintaining diastolic flow. This is also one of the reasons why younger people, let's say below 50, will often have diastolic hypertension. But when they start getting past 50, most hypertensive have primarily systolic. And that's because they can't maintain much diastolic flow. They've lost their elastic fibers, all right? But the higher that systolic pressure goes, the more they're going to start getting side effects of hypertension. Hypertension is a big deal. It's the number one risk factor for having a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, and that's the most common cause of death in this country, so you don't want that. It's the uh, number one risk factor for having a cerebral vascular accident, which is a fancy way of saying having a stroke. It's also the number one predispos predisposing thing to causing dementia. I look at brains every day, and I can tell you all these old people, people after 50 years of age, they've got all these little patches of dead brain tissue, and it's typically attributed just to hypertension. And hypertension is really a dangerous place to be. The reason is you're screwed either way. If the blood pressure goes too high with hypertension, you'll have a tendency to bleed into your brain. It, first of all, the higher blood pressure promotes atherosclerosis, so you get a special type of stroke called lacuna infarctions. Secondarily, it'll also have a tendency then to cause microbleeds. Small ones are called cerebral microbleeds. Bigger ones are called intracranial interparenchymal hemorrhages. You see that all the time from hypertension. Every month I see people who are demented in their 40s from hypertension, okay? Super common cause of dementia as people get, as people get older. There's a disease you'll hear about called cerebral amyloid angiopathy, and they're gonna tell you, oh, it's separate, it's a subtype of Alzheimer's. There's so much overlap between cerebral amyloid angiopathy and hypertensive encephalopathy. You know, sometimes I can tell the difference, but quite often they merge into each other. I think they're primarily the same thing. The other thing is you'll hear about people getting hypertensive uh, retinal hemorrhages or diabetic retinal hemorrhages. The same people who are tending to get that stuff are getting cerebral microbleeds, okay? The eyes are a window to the brain, window to the soul, window to the brain. The eye is almost part of the brain, really. The optic nerve is, is a cranial nerve part of the brain. And then the retina is very similar to the brain. And the unique thing about the eyes, you could see it with a microscope pretty well. So what I'm basically saying is hypertension is a big deal. Just because you don't feel symptoms of it initially, it's a big deal. What causes hypertension? There's multiple things here. Uh, saturated fat, saturated fat, we talked about this before in another lecture, that saturated fat causes red blood cells to stick together. That's because it increases LDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol overcomes the zeta potential of red blood cells, which means the sialic acids on the glycocalyx of the red blood cell. Normally red blood cells repel each other with LDL cholesterol. It'll take them and it'll stick them together. And overcoming that zeta potential 
means rouleau, which means in French a stack of coins. So your RBCs are about the same size as a capillary, about five to seven microns. It's harder for the heart to pump through a stack of coins than it would be individual red blood cells. You have to pump them through and they have to deform in their shape a little bit to get through those capillaries because they're about the same size. So when they're all stuck together in rouleau, blood pressure goes up. Saturated fats accumulate in the plasma membrane and the phospholipids of the red blood cells plasma membrane and they interdigitate very tightly, sat fat in comparison, let's say, with an unsaturated fat, one that has double bonds in it. The point being is a stiff red blood cell um, takes more energy, higher blood pressure to pump it through the capillaries. Um, in addition, the same patients that are eating a lot of sat fat, they tend to have diabetes eventually over time and they'll have more uh, high blood glucose. The high blood glucose will predispose them to um, having more glycation of the red blood cells, again, making them stiff. They'll also tend to have more advanced glycation end products from diabetes related physiology, which can glycate, indirectly glycate, it's like glycation, um, the red blood cells and cause increased pressure because of that reason. So it ends up being a big mess. Insulin resistance causes sodium retention in the kidney. That's another reason why diabetics are almost always hypertension and hypertensives are often diabetic. They kind of go together. You don't want anything to do with diabetes. You want to avoid that as much as you can. Sleep deprivation is perceived by the body as stress. Stress increases cortisol and catecholamines. Cortisol is a hormone that has a little bit of mineralocorticoid activity, meaning that it has a little bit of an effect to cause sodium retention and volume expansion of the blood, leading to hypertension. Okay, catecholamines. That's like norepinephrine and epinephrine, also known as noradrenaline and adrenaline. They increase blood pressure. What else? Psychological stress is the same thing. Sleep deprivation perceived like stress, increasing these hormones. Caffeine does the same thing. That's why people tell me, oh, I'm so stressed out, I gotta have a cup of coffee. That's stupid, because you're just basically increasing the hormones, you increase in stress, you're making yourself more stressed. Coffee has a long, caffeine has a long half-life too, it's like six to eight hours. So a lot of people, they'll have a couple cups of coffee a day, and they're basically, keeping these hormones elevated all the time, interfering with their sleep, driving their blood pressure up. Sodium itself, we talked about this in another lecture, but the bottom line is humans are probably only designed to have about 200 to 500 milligrams a day of sodium, or 150 to 500 milligrams a day, and they're routinely eating around as much as 10,000. That really makes people sick, and they don't even realize it, but they're, they're messed up. A lot of people are walking around thinking, oh, I got mild diabetes, I got a little mild hypertension, it's no big deal, it's under control. Yeah, right, that person metabolically is very ill and at very high risk for stroke, myocardial infarction, and cancer. Um, it's one of the advantages of being ignorant is then you don't even realize how sick you are. <laughs> but man, I see tons of people that are very sick and they don't even realize it. Uh, they don't do well in the long run. All right, so that's sodium. You wanna minimize your sodium intake as much as you can. In addition, what's the big deal about sodium? It's a vasoconstrictor, it inhibits endothelial nitric oxide, meaning that nitric oxide is a vasodilator produced by the lining of arterial cells, and it's, it's your friend. You want nitric oxide to be high to keep those arteries wide open. When nitric oxide is blocked, the artery constricts. You have to drive up pressure to get the blood through. causes hypertension. In addition, every individual cell has sodium-potassium pumps along its plasma cell membrane, and that pumping system is based on a relationship between the amount of potassium and the amount of sodium. When sodium goes up, potassium goes down. They're like a, they're like a seesaw. If sodium is high, potassium is low. And you really want more potassium. Remember, P for plants, P for potassium. There's no other animal than the modern human eating this processed food junk diet that ends up eating more sodium than potassium. And it doesn't just cause hypertension. It disrupts the plasma cell membrane gradients of sodium and potassium in every cell in your body. So what am I saying? I'm saying when you're hypertensive, you have a problem with every cell in your body maintaining these gradients. And then the sodium potassium pump is connected to the, the sodium calcium exchanger. And so what's happening is you can't control intracellular calcium as well as you should when you have too high of a sodium. What that does is it leads a constant leakage of calcium intracellular within your vascular smooth muscle cells, keeping them at a high contractile tone or tension. And guess what? Contracting your arteries drives up your blood pressure because you have to pump at a higher pressure to get the blood through a tight system. So it's a bad thing. We'll talk about that more in the future in some other lecture because uh, it's kind of a complex subject, all the plasma membrane pumps. Alcohol is a problem because the alcohol you know, two carbon units, ethanol, ethyl alcohol. They go right into the liver, the liver makes them into saturated fat. The saturated fat then does the same thing that it does when it comes from meat. 
drives up your blood pressure. You know, the most common saturated fat made in the liver is like palmitate, palmitic acid, C16O, 16 carbons with no double bonds, okay? Uh, alcohol also sometimes causes secondary insomnia. You might be a little bit drunk and go to sleep, but then you'll often wake up at night and not sleep so well, and in the long run, it's really bad. My advice, don't drink any alcohol. It's a tumor promoter. I know some people want their one cup of wine. I think it's a mistake, but it's not that big of a deal. Uh, a lot of people habitually drink. They have terrible outcomes. Major cause of poor aging and cognitive decline. Fructose. Fructose gets made into saturated fat in the liver. It's like a toxin all uh, metabolized in the liver. And then leads to increased sodium because it causes increased sodium reabsorption from the gut and from the kidney. So it predisposes you to being hypertensive with fatty liver and diabetes. Stay away from fructose, which means stay away from any soda pop or sweetened drink. Uric acid is also increased by fructose. Fructose uniquely, when it's metabolized by the liver, uh, ATP is initially used to phosphorylate it, but that ATP then going to ADP subsequently gets degraded all the way down into AMP and eventually uric acid is the waste product from that. And uric acid also inhibits endothelial nitric oxide causing hypertension. So what's the solution? Avoid meat, avoid fructose, alcohol, um, avoid added salt, eat plants to get your potassium, and those things will decrease your risk. We'll, have, we'll talk about the physiologist more in a future lecture too. This will call this like part one of hypertension, but the bottom line is take it very seriously, try to avoid it.